A thought terminating cliche is a form of loaded language intended to end an argument and quell cognitive dissonance. Its function is to stop an argument from proceeding further, ending the debate with a cliche rather than a point. But what does this have to do with the religion of Jehovah's Witnesses? Find out in this week's episode of the Jexit Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Jexit Podcast. I'm your host Riley, a former Jehovah's Witness who left the religion in 2019. So this week I'm speaking about thought-terminating cliches and how they relate to Jehovah's Witnesses. But before we dive into this, let's really pin down what a thought-terminating cliche actually is by looking at some common everyday examples. Now, One that immediately springs to mind is because I said so. I think we've all heard this one at some point in our lives, probably during childhood, because it's something that's most often said by parents to their children in response to the question, why? Parents usually use this one when they're asked to provide a reason for enforcing a particular rule or prohibition. Now, if they don't have a reason for said rule, they'll shut down further questions by framing their child's question as a challenge to their parental authority, which they then reassert by responding with, because I said so. This is something that I found particularly frustrating when I was a child because I've always been someone who asks a lot of questions and demands reasons for things. And not just any old reason, a reason that actually makes logical sense. So as I'm sure you can imagine, this led to a lot of friction between me and my parents. Another example is, there's no smoke without fire. This one is used to convince others that a person is guilty based on an accusation or hearsay and to discourage any further examination of relevant evidence. And one final example is more of a modern one, and that is YOLO, which stands for you only live once. So how is YOLO a thought terminated cliche? Well, YOLO is usually said or even yelled or shouted by someone who's about to engage in some kind of activity that they know deep down is an unwise course of action. It could be something as inconsequential as eating a cupcake or as dangerous as jumping off a cliff on a mountain bike. (laughs) But the point is that if the person gave themselves enough time to think it through, they'd likely have second thoughts and talk themselves out of doing it. But because this activity is either pleasurable, fun or exciting, they want to do it anyway and they justify their decision with the phrase YOLO. Now what these three examples have in common is that their purpose is to end further debate, deliberation or discussion. The person saying the cliche hopes that those listening will accept it as the final word on the matter and give the issue no further thought. So how does all of this relate to the religion of Jehovah's Witnesses? Something that has become extremely apparent to me since leaving the Jehovah's Witnesses is how much of the religion relies on its members' lack of thinking ability. If you're an XJW, please think back to when you were in the religion. How many unanswered questions did you have that you had to just force yourself to stop thinking about and push to the back of your mind? It's safe to say that Critical thinking is a trait that's entirely incompatible with this higher control religion. And as a result, thought terminating cliches are abundant in the religion's vernacular. So let's look at some examples. First up, we have the chariot is on the move. 
Now, to anyone who's never been a JW, this will sound very strange and it's not immediately obvious what it means. So I'll try to explain as briefly and succinctly as possible. So the chariot being referred to here is the one from the Bible book of Ezekiel. In chapter one, Ezekiel has a vision of God's celestial chariot, and he goes into great detail explaining what this chariot looks like. Well, the JW religion interprets this vision as representing how God has been directing the earthly part of his organization from Bible times right up until the present day. The speed of the chariot is supposed to represent how quickly Jehovah can organize his people to accomplish a particular purpose. And the chariot is said to be able to change direction very quickly and without slowing down, which is supposed to represent how efficiently the organization can change direction when necessary. So this cliche, the chariot is on a move, is most often used when there's been a major change in the religion's doctrine or policy. To counteract questions of why such changes have been made, the response is that the chariot is on the move. Okay, and next up we have keep up with the chariot. Now, this one is closely related to the previous one. It's referring to the same chariot, but this cliche is used to silence dissent. So imagine a situation where the congregation has made some doctrinal or policy change that doesn't really go down well with some members of the congregation. Perhaps it's a change that some members either disagree with or don't understand. Well, in response to their concerns, those members will be told to keep up with the chariot. In other words, put your concerns aside, let go of your attachment to the old way of doing things and obediently fall in line. I can imagine that many older JWs will have been told this one in recent times relating to the policy change on men wearing beards. I personally know a few older JWs who I'm certain would have disapproved of that particular change. And the next thought terminating cliche is don't run ahead of the chariot. I promise this is the last one about chariots. So with this one, imagine a situation where a member of the congregation feels that the governing body is incorrect about a particular policy or doctrine. For example, the requirement for publishers to report their ministry time before the policy was changed, of course. So this Jehovah's Witness has fully researched the subject using the Bible and the organization's own publications. And they've concluded that there's no scriptural basis for this requirement. And they present their findings to an elder in their congregation. What happens next? Well, the worst case scenario is that they're disfellowshipped for apostasy. (laughs) But the best case scenario is that they're told not to run ahead of the chariot. You must keep up with the chariot, but you must remain behind it at all times because it's the chariot that does the leading, not you. Even if the chariot ends up going in the direction that you predicted or felt that it should go, You were still wrong for going there first, instead of waiting for the chariot to take the lead. So this cliche is a way of telling people that even if you're right, you're still wrong. In fact, recently after the policy change regarding beards was announced, a governing body member said exactly that during a talk. He warned Jehovah's Witnesses against having an attitude of, I told you so, so to speak. Because many JWs have been saying for decades that there's nothing scripturally wrong with wearing a beard. But even though they were right, they were still wrong because they ran ahead of the chariot. The next cliche on our list is don't lean on your own understanding. This one is taken from Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 to 6. And Jehovah's Witnesses use this verse as a way of suppressing their doubts and the doubts of others. To explain this one further, I'll give you a personal example of how I used this particular 
thought terminating cliche to suppress my own doubts. So one Bible account that never sat well with me was the one found in 2 Kings chapter 2, where God sent two bears to maul a group of children who mocked the prophet Elisha for being bald. Now this account always baffled me for two reasons. Firstly, I've been bald since I was 22 years old. And since then, I've been teased about my lack of hair by friends and family alike. And you know what I did at each and every one of those times? I laughed along with them. Sometimes I even joined in and mocked myself. It's really not that big of a deal. Not once did I ever feel like retaliating violently, let alone trying to use a wild animal to kill the person teasing me. Secondly, these were children. In what universe does it make sense to kill a child for teasing someone? I don't think I've ever witnessed, read or heard about a worse case of overreacting at an offence. So this Bible account caused me to question Jehovah's sense of justice for years, decades even. So what did I do? I told myself not to lean upon my own understanding. I told myself that Jehovah is much wiser than I am and that even if I don't understand his actions, everything he does is good. Come to think of it, the dogmatic assertion that all of God's actions are good is another thought-terminating cliche in itself. This next one is quite obscure. To be honest, I've only ever heard this from one Jehovah's Witness, so I'm not certain if it's a cliche that's widely used in the religion. The cliche is in the form of a question. Is it a matter of salvation? So let me give you some background on this one. I was once on a night out, me and some friends went to see a movie and on the way back, three of us were sitting in a car just talking. One of my friends expressed some doubts he'd had about the religion's position on carbon dating. If you're unfamiliar with what that is, essentially the religion disagrees with and tries to discredit the process of carbon dating, but only where the results conflict with Bible chronology. So this friend said that he'd researched it and had some concerns because carbon dating seems to be quite a reliable method of aging the earth and many of the things on it. So our other friend, who was an elder, tried for a while to discredit carbon dating, but ultimately resorted to the thought-terminating cliché of, is it a matter of salvation? Now, the idea behind this cliché is that whatever doubts you have about the organisation, the Bible, or the religion's interpretation of it, as long as your salvation doesn't hinge upon that issue, then it's not really that important. An everyday equivalent of that cliché would be something like, don't major in the minors. So, according to this thought-terminating cliché, the only major issues you should be overly concerned with are things like the ransom sacrifice, Jesus' resurrection, the appointment of the governing body by Jesus, etc. If you have concerns or questions about those things, then by all means address them. Otherwise, it's not really worth it. Okay, let's do one more. This is also one that I have a personal history with. And that is the advice to be yielding. Honestly, I hate this one so much. So the idea behind this thought terminating cliche is that all true Christians are willing to forego their own rights and conveniences to serve the greater purpose of maintaining peace and harmony in various situations in everyday life, whether it's in the home, at work, but especially in the congregation. This thought-terminating cliché is nothing more than guilting people into being complicit in their own abuse and getting them to accept ill-treatment from others. 
Now, I'm quite a peaceable person by nature and conflict is something that I've always tried to avoid, more so when I was a Jehovah's Witness than now. So this advice to be yielding is one that I took seriously. And with hindsight, I can clearly see how this part of my personality was weaponized against me by means of this cliche in so many situations that caused me a lot of mental and emotional distress and also led to me being seriously disadvantaged in various ways. Imagine you're a Jehovah's Witness and you have a dispute with another member of the congregation. The dispute is such that this other congregation member has treated you in an unfair manner. It could be a friend, an elder, or even your spouse. If the elders get involved and advise you to just be yielding, no thought is given to whether or not you've been wronged or whether or not the person you're in the dispute with shows a pattern of bullying or otherwise abusive behavior. The advice is essentially to roll over and take it, to just accept the treatment you've been given and to stop complaining about it. The last time I was given this piece of counsel was a couple of weeks after I was disfellowshipped or removed from the congregation, as they call it now. I was meeting with a couple of elders from the congregation I had most recently attended, which wasn't the congregation I was disfellowshipped from. I explained to them that I was going to stop attending meetings and seeking reinstatement because I was no longer convinced that Jehovah is a God of justice because he was sitting back and watching me be falsely accused of multiple quote-unquote sins that I hadn't even committed, knowing full well that I was innocent of them and was doing nothing about it. I explained how unfair this was, and the elder's response was to quote the account of Job, who had a lot of unfair things happen to him, but he carried on worshipping Jehovah and yielded. That was the final straw for me and I haven't set foot in a kingdom hall since. So that's my take on thought terminating cliches in the JW religion. But before I finish up, I just want to say that words and phrases used in this way aren't always bad. They may be valid in certain contexts. For example, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. The idea behind this cliche is that eating healthily can result in fewer bouts of illness. I'm sure we can all agree that this is solid advice. But the purpose of thought terminating cliches is to stop you from using your own critical thinking skills. And anyone who actively tries to stop you from thinking is not your friend and definitely doesn't have your best interests at heart. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please like, comment and subscribe if you're listening on YouTube or subscribe and rate the podcast if you're listening on a podcast platform. This really helps to get in front of as many listeners as possible. Thanks again for listening and I hope you have a great week.